and welcome to the Krug Show, everybody. Larry Kruger with you on a Thursday on the Krug Show, brought to you by Pig and a Pickle. Two locations. Check them out in Emeryville, and they're open five days a week in Emeryville, Wednesday through Sunday. They're open seven days a week in Corte de Madera, the best barbecue in the Bay Area. Check out Pig and a Pickle. All right, with us today on the guest line is the great Ron Wotus, who has spent decades with the Giants. Giants getting ready to open camp in Arizona. We thought, what a great time to get Ron on the show. Ron, how are you? I'm great, Larry. Um, all is good. Weather's getting nicer. It's it's time to go to Arizona, right? Absolutely. And now, how, what year is this for you with the Giants? Um, well, I could tell you I did 24 in the major league staff, so 25, just 26 in the big leagues. And then I did 11. What did I do? I don't know. Um, I'm not real good at the math. 30 something. <laughs> Let's say 30 something. How many years was I with the Giants? 20, 26. And then I think I played two and managed seven. So that's nine. 35. How's that sound? That sounds very good. Um, so what, <laughs> Hey, you're, you're starting off with these really tough questions. <laughs> no, seriously. That's what is, like you. <laughs> what is your middle name? No, uh, <laughs> you know, before we get into the club, um, what is your role this year? I mean, what, 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 what will you be doing? Your role has morphed through the years. You've, you've done m- a number of different roles, coach, third base, bench coach, minor league manager. Um, what is your role this year? Well, I'm going to do the same thing that I did last year. Um, the, the title is a special assistant to player development. Um, I love working with players and, and trying to get them better. And uh, basically what I do is I'm at the majority of home games in uniform. And then I watch the game out of uniform upstairs and then stop back in after the game to see the boys. And, uh, you know, just as if I was one of the coaches, but uh, I'm not in the dugout, obviously. And when the team travels, um, I travel to minor leagues. I do the majority of my my travel to San Jose. Um, I spend quite a few days there, and I spend quite a few days up in Sacramento, AAA. Um, And then I may venture out here and there at a couple minor league uh, situations um, as well. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing what this club looks like this year. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that that are eager to see what the what the uh, what the club looks like this year for sure. Before we get to that, um, you know, one of the great stories in the Bay Area as I've been covering the Niners this season is the emergence of Brock Purdy, and then it came out that his dad Sean pitched for the Giants in the organization in the minor leagues, and then I read somewhere that you actually managed. Brock's dad. Do you, do you, what, what were your recollections of Sean Purdy uh, as the pitcher, as a former minor league pitcher? Yeah, you know, when I found out that was uh, Sean's son, Brock, I mean, it just brought a smile to my face and I, I didn't want to miss a game. Um, well, you know, his dad was very similar to Brock, what, what you're seeing. I mean, I don't know Brock personally, but his dad was, you know, quiet, um, you know, did his job, a hard worker. A little bit of a bulldog on the mound, um, you know, never, never really complained or made excuses. And he had good stuff. You know, he was actually my closer in Shreveport, Louisiana. That was double A and also in Phoenix in triple A. And um, he had a nice arm, you know, low 90s, had some sink, uh, had a very good change up in a slider. And, um, you know, I thought he was a major league caliber pitcher, but he had some injuries and things never really uh, took off for him to to establish himself in the major leagues. Well, you know, this is a it's going to be an interesting year for the Giants on the diamond. And, you know, you're a guy who's had a lot of um, impact on the Giants defensively, especially in the infield. What do you think of the infield? I know the the goal was to get more athletic up the middle. Um, we all know kind of how things went in the off season. We don't need to get into that, but wh- how do you feel about the club as is, as they, as they head to camp? Well, you know, when, when you, when you go to spring training, you're always feeling good about your club, no matter who you have. I'll start off saying that because, um, you know, it, it, it's not about the names that you sign or, or, or the names that you have on paper. Sure. We'd all like to have a bunch of all-stars on our roster going into spring training, But, uh, you know, if you believe in your guys and uh, we have quite a few returning guys and we've added some uh, pretty good players, you know, you feel good about it. Um, So 
to your question, what what in the infield? I mean, we have Craw anchoring it down. Um, you have Estrada that can back him up if there's an issue. And you know, the the left handed the left handed bat at first base and at third base is a little different for us this year with Tommy Listella not on the club and Brandon Belt gone. Um, it's possible you could see Peterson, I would think, at some first base. I mean, that's always a possibility. Um, and, and someone may emerge for that. But I, I expect that, you know, VR, J.D. Davis, um, Wade, Lamont Wade will play some first base, obviously. Um, it could be a mainstay there if that's the way it shakes down. So there are options. And you basically have the same guys in, uh, you know, Craw and Estrada there. You have Flores, excuse me, Flores will play a lot of first. So we have some offense there and we have some options and flexibility. Um, behind the plate, you know, Joey Bart, Austin wins, and maybe the possibility of Blake Sable, uh, a rule five draft pick. What do you know about Sable? Is he, is he, a, is he more of a hitter than a fielder? Or how do you, how do you see that, that uh, backup catcher, position coming on yeah he, he um he, he's definitely a bat i mean that's that's where his strength is that's where he uh his his bread is buttered um he hasn't taught a whole lot uh you know in his baseball career mostly uh behind the plate i'm sorry larry i'm sorry i i, I oh, got a the, dog bark no here. don't worry about it not even a problem we i've got penny uh you know 15 feet away and actually i've seen your dog when i was playing when i was playing basketball with my son you were walking that dog that's that's <laughs> right well he's going nuts right now i got the solar guys here you know and all of a sudden he's barking like crazy so i don't know if we need to restart i can go outside and do no this. no you're it's fine don't worry not a, not a problem at all let him let him bark it's not <laughs> Well, he's he's distracting the heck out of me. I'm gonna I'm gonna head outside here. Okay, no problem, no problem. We got Ron Wotus with us on the show today. We had a little problem hooking up the connection, so we're so we've got Ron via the cell phone, and he's getting work done on his house, and now he's got the dog barking. But the challenges we will somehow we will, we will we will overcome the challenges. Uh, it's the beauty well, of yeah, live the good, beauty of live radio or live uh, internet. It's always something. It reminds me of Tim Flannery's distraction drill in spring training where <laughs> he'd have guys bunning down on the half field and you would take all the pitchers that weren't bunning and they would put something in their hand, a water bottle or a ball, and a guy would be bunting and he'd throw a pitch and he went straight at him and throwing stuff at him while he's bunning to get him to focus on the baseball. So I'm going to see if I can lock it in here. There we go. There we go. Uh, and we appreciate your time and hope, I'm going to be headed down to Arizona for a week there in the late March. Maybe we can, we can hook up down there for sure. Um, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting deal this year because, you know, Longoria and Belt have moved on and both those guys were stellar defensive players. Um, especially Evan, I thought Evan, you know, was so, so good at third base. I mean, there was... There were so many times I watched him and I thought, wow, it would have been something to see Evan in his prime in a Giants uniform. But he still had a tremendous glove the last few years. And and um, and obviously that's going to be missed. Um, what what do you think, Ron, of Lamont Wade as a defensive player? I know, you know, he's going to get an opportunity this year to play some first base. Um, he struggles if you look at the numbers, but he also is pretty athletic with probably, you know, better range than a lot of first basemen. How do you, how do you feel about Lamont over there at the one bag? Well, you know, you, you're right. He was hurt a lot last year with that hip. And, uh, I, I think he, I think he's fine over there at first base. He worked really hard last year at getting better. I mean, he doesn't have a lot of experience, um, but he, he catches the ball. He throws the ball okay. You know, that's a position that a lot of stuff comes up, and you like to have some experience because, you know, different situations arise. That little Bermuda Triangle ball where the pitcher and the first baseman goes at it. Sometimes if you don't have enough reps there, that can rear its ugly head. Um, but all in all, um, you know, the thing that I love to have at first base is a tall guy, you know, a tie guy that uh, when you're thrown across the diamond, um, you got a big target or he can reach up to the side cause he's got some length to it. So he, he's not on the taller side, 
um, which which I know as an infielder you, you don't love, but he he did okay. So I I think he's going to be fine over there. It's going to boil down to hitting, you know. Um, obviously, whoever hits, and I agree with what you're saying, is with the uh, Longo being gone, he was really really good. Um, but I think um, we we will we'll be okay, you know, with Crawford and Estrada out there, Lamont, Flores, JD. Um, you know, maybe a little short on range here and there. But I think all in all, if we get the offense up there, it's going to go ahead and, and, and cover on the defensive side. I really liked what I saw out of J.D. Davis uh, after he came over last year. H- how is J.D.'s glove at third? I mean, how do you view his glove? Because I know he can play first, he can play third. But, man, if he hits, um, you know, that's a nice pickup. You know, when you watch him in practice, and, you know, I, obviously I watch them in the games as well. I mean, he does everything right. I mean, he, he looks really, really good. And, and, you know, I, over his career, I know his range isn't, isn't tremendous, but all we need him to do is, is make the routine play and the, and the balls that he can get to. So um, he's got a rocket of an arm. He really does have a good arm. And, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that he's going to have maybe a career year and really blossom into a player uh, that we think he can be because he has all the tools. He's playing here in the Bay Area where, you know, it's he's back home. And, um, you know, New York is a very difficult place to play with the fans, and it's a totally different feel. So hopefully he'll get to relax and he'll put up one of his best years offensively and defensively. Um, one guy who I, you know, I, you know, JD, uh, I mean, JT Snow was doing some broadcasts last year down at AAA, and they would do like a WB Saturday night game. And I, I would catch these Saturday night, you know, Giants played in the afternoon, let's say on a Saturday in the summer. And all of a sudden I'm dialing around on the tube at night and there's uh, the River Cats and J, uh, JT doing the broadcast. So I had a chance to watch this Izon, Izon Diaz and he's a nice hitter. I mean, there's no question, line drive, gap to gap hitter. Um, what do you think of Diaz? Do you think, of, what's his, what does he profile as defensively? How does he play in the field? Well, you watch him take ground balls. He's kind of like Longo, you know. You watch Longo take ground balls, and he's he's a slick fielder. Um, you know, he's basically, in my opinion, he's he's a he's a solid second baseman. Um, he turns the double play very very good. He's got really quick hands, and that's really his strength is at second base. Um, his range is good. He's he's got he's got uh, you know average average solid average range. Um, but you mentioned his bat. Um, he's got a lot of thunder in that bat. He hits for power. And, you know, the thing for him is going to be is, is the contact rate and putting the ball in play. So he's a guy that a lot of people uh, were impressed with last year. And it's nice to see they got him coming to Major League Spring Training, and he's going to get a good look. You know, and the other question will be is, you know, how he looks at third base. He hasn't played a whole lot there, but he can play third. I think shortstop is a little bit more of a stretch. And uh, for him to play the shortstop we would want, um, he's going to have to do some work uh, with his throwing, et cetera. But, you know, if he can fill in at second and, and at third in an emergency at short, um, this kid's got a, a, a chance. To, to help the club this year. Mm, that's it. How about VR? You know, it's, I, I like VR's bat. Um, where do you see him? What What's his best defensive position in your mind? Now well, his best position is third base because he's played it his whole career. Um, again, first base, you know, everybody thinks first base is an easy place to play. And if, you know, my cuts, because JT Snow and, you know, Will Clark and all these guys make it look so easy, Brandon Belt. Uh, but again, it's a little easier now than it used to be because you don't have all the bunt plays that are involved and, and all the, you know, plays you can use with a a really good first baseman like Brandon belt charging down and and running crash plays. So those things aren't as important. Um, but, uh, um, yeah, I, I think that, uh, you know, who, who, who the heck were we talking about there, Larry? We're talking about VR. Oh, VR, that's right. I lost my train of thought. <laughs> I got I have so many distractions today, it's unbelievable. I need more work in spring training with with, with Flan on the backfield. <laughs> but but VR just doesn't have the reps at first base. Yeah. You know, he, he doesn't have the reps. So um, you know, he, he can play it over there, but I think his best position without without a question 
would be would be third base, then first base, and then second base, just because of the limited experience and his quickness and range there. One of the guys that I hear an awful lot about who's not on the roster, but I think will be down there in Arizona, is Casey Schmidt. Um, and, you know, people talk about Casey Schmidt like he's, you know, like he's uh, the like the kid Chapman who played for the A's so so many years at third base, Matt Chapman. How how good is Casey Schmidt defensively, Ron? And and I think he had a pretty decent year at Double A, so he might not be that far away if uh, if you know he can continue to improve offensively. Well, his strength has been you know obviously defense. I mean, he really is something to watch. You know, he's a, he's a Schmidt. So he's got some of that other Schmidt in his blood that used to play for Philadelphia. Yeah. Um, not that they're related, but um, he is really good with the glove. He is just a natural, um, very, very athletic, uh, can make all the plays, slow rollers to his right, to his left. Um, and it'll boil down to, to the bat, but I think people will be impressed with his ability to play third base. And, um, you know, he has some thunder in that bat and, you know, he's, he really had a big year last year, which you want to see, you want to see guys get better. And, and he cut down on his strikeouts and uh, he showed the power that's in the bat. So, you know, you know, Larry, you know, the, the big leagues as good as anybody from watching it, it's going to boil down when you're facing that good major league pitching. You know, you, you're going to have to be uh, productive offensively. And, and if you're not, the defense isn't going to keep you in the lineup, obviously, unless you're a shortstop or there's a huge need somewhere on the diamond for that late in the game. So um, for him, it'll be fun to see him in his first major league camp. And uh, but, you know, I think we should temper our expectations a little bit with some of these young guys because there's not a lot of openings, you know, unless there's injuries. Um, these guys could use some more seasoning and hone their game a little bit more, but it'll be a good experience for him to come to camp and see what he can do. Yeah. It was, it was probably two or three years ago now, Ron, but I was watching a giants Indians game. uh, You know, this is pre guardians, um, uh, you know, on from, from Scott steel stadium. It was a night game a few years ago. You probably remember this game and Elliot Ramos hit an absolute line drive dead center, I think, or maybe a little bit to right center. And it just got out of the park in a second. I mean, it was an incredible, incredible bat speed, incredible line drive home run. And I really thought, man, this kid is on the verge of a breakthrough and people are, you know, I love his, I love everything about him at the plate. It seemed like, uh, you know, um, and it just didn't happen. It just, it, he just fell apart last year. And I, and I, to me, I, I would be deathly afraid to trade this guy or cut him because he's just got so much ability. W- where, where are you with Elliot Ramos? What, what's happened to his game? Um, is there any new hope this spring that maybe you guys can unlock whatever it is that's got him locked up? Because there's a lot of talent there. Yeah, there, there is. And, and to quote the great Felipe Alou, you know, I, I always like Elliot because he's an assertive kid. He's, he's aggressive, he's assertive, and I like that in a player. He's not passive, you know, you know he's not shy. Um, and, um, you know, so he, he can run, he can throw, um, he plays the game hard, et cetera, et cetera. But again, it's going to boil down to the bat. I think he's just had some struggles at the plate. I know they've changed his mechanics a couple times, um, trying to get him more of a load or a little more rhythm at the plate. You know, it's hard to hit when you just have dead hands and, you know, I liken it to, you know, you look at a guy like VR, you know, I mean, Ramos got the bat speed. He has the strength. He has all of it, but you know, the biggest difference is VR has got a great feel for hitting, you know, and you know, you can't always teach that. And, and Ramos has a few more things to work out in his swing as well as, uh, the feel and approach to hitting, which the really good ones have. So it's going to be a big year for him. Um, he's going to get a good look, but he's going to have to show some, some improvement offensively, uh, for him to, to, to get where he needs to go. Um, couple last ones before we let you go outfield defense to me is one of the most underrated aspects of winning baseball. And the Giants really struggled, especially in left field last year. Now Conforto comes over. He's probably going to man left. Uh, you got Hanniger and right. What do you think of the outfield defense upgrades? And, and you know, who? how would you grade out a Conforto and a Hanniger on the, on the flanks? 
Yeah, well, Hannah Girl, I haven't seen play a whole lot, you know. Um, but, you know, look, when, when you talk about, you know, Jock, Jock, you know, his range out there, he didn't grade out. If you talk to the analysts and you look at his numbers, he didn't grade out very well. And, and we saw what happened when we were playing – Darren Ruff in left field too much last year. He really ended up hurting us um, a a few times just because he's not an outfielder and he doesn't have this speed. So I think we've upgraded the outfield in that regard, um, whether it's Hanniger or Conforto. Now, as far as Conforto goes, I haven't seen him play in a couple of years. The guy has been hurt, but, and, and, you know, he's, he was a solid outfielder for New York. Um, you know, nothing about his speed in his game ever jumped out. Like, you know, he can go, you know, go get the ball, run it down. So I view him as a corner outfielder as well, but I think all in all, and you got Lamont, if he's healthy, he may be in the outfield as well. Cause last year he was banged up and couldn't move. So I think all in all, um, we have offensive players in the outfield. That's their strengths. And, and probably the range and in the, in the quickness is not, you know, uh, part of part of their game. But it's not part of a lot of people's game today. You know, it's more about the offense. So I, I like the guys we have out there. I think probably that's where we improved the club more than anywhere is we have a lot of major league players on the roster. You know, the guys you just mentioned are major league players and it goes for the outfield. It goes for the starting staff and and it filters into the infield as well with the players we have out there. Is there a young player or a, or not a young player? Is there any player that you're particularly looking forward to seeing this spring that they've either made changes or, you know, internally they're, they've tinkered with something or, or you guys really project growth. Is there one guy you're like, hey, man, I can't wait to see this guy in the cage or see this guy on the field this this spring? Uh, not necessarily in the tweaks. You know, you, you talked about the young players. You talked about, about the guys that, that we just talked about. You know, I want to see J.D. J, J. Davis, you know, come into his own. I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to seeing the new guys. Joey Bart. Obviously, he had a stretch last year where he put it all together. Um, I got a close eye on him because his upside is still through the roof on, on what he can offer uh, behind the plate and offensively um, if he can if he can keep that together. So he's a guy, David VR, you mentioned, um, you know, look, he, he's got a great feel for hitting. See how he does in his second year. I think I think he he's a he's a very good hitter and uh, so so those are some of the guys you know and then in in the bullpen obviously uh, wait see how he performs in spring training he's got a nice swing and miss arm he did a good job for the Giants at the end of the year last year so you know I I think uh, I think we have some well, as I said uh, major league players in camp guys that can contribute. And now it's just up to us, you know, the coaches and, and the manager to get the most out of these guys and, and get this thing moving in the right direction. Hey, two last questions for you, Ron, and we appreciate the time. Two of my favorite Giants of all time, different eras, but two of my very favorites. One, Will Clark, and the other is uh, Ryan Vogelsong. And I know they're both in the organization helping out in the minor leagues. You've you've been, you know you've been a minor league manager. You've you've done every role almost. What do you think of Will? and and vogi as uh you know instructors you know i know will's n- never really shown an interest in managing but i think he could well Wotus, i mean um Volga song's never shown a uh, that he wants to be a full-time pitching coach but man i think he could what do you think of those two guys when you see them working with young players well, you, you mentioned two of the greatest competitors that have put on a Giants uniform. And I know there's a lot of them. You can throw Matt Williams in there. and There's a lot of other people as well. But, um, you know, I, I love these guys. I love I love the the approach that they have, uh, the seriousness and, and also the lightheartedness that they could have. I mean, they're great coaches working with young players because they can connect with people. And, you know, they could they can be tough when they need to be tough to get their point across. It's uh, and I think that's what the good coaches do. You know, it's just like, you know, dealing with your kids. you got to know when to put your foot down and, and, and get them moving in the right direction. Like like Dusty Baker will say, you know, he'll talk to a guy and he'll say, listen to me. Right. And, he, and the guy will it will make the same mistake. And then Dusty will say, hey, listen to me. 
and the guy makes the same mistake again. And then, then next time he sees the guy, he starts yelling at him. I'm telling you to listen to me. You got to listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> so he ratchets, he, he, he takes it up a notch because it's that important to the players to career. And when you have a relationship with people, um, like Vogie and, and Will can do, I, I think they're, they're great coaches. Now I'm not sure if Vogie is going to even be with us this year. Honestly, I, I saw him this winter, and I'm not sure if he's coming back to do the same role or not. So um, I hope he is. I love being around him. And I know Boach had interest in him in Texas this winter as well uh, as the assistant pitching coach job. Oh, wow. Um, that, didn't, that didn't materialize. But, uh, yeah, no, they're, they're, both, uh, they're both quality. Can't get any better than those guys. Hey, last one, the rules changes, the pitch timer, the shift restrictions, the bigger bases. To you, what's the biggest change? Like, what's the what's the change that you're like, wow, I'm, I've really got to really look at that, investigate it, think about it, digest it. Is there one rule change that you're looking at this year? Well, the two that are going to be most difficult for everybody is the pitch clock, obviously. I know I'm just talking to Mark Halbert. Pitchers and catchers started today getting these pitchers that have never had to deliver the ball um in a timely manner to do so i mean when it's not cutting time at the end of the game and you got first and third you got a guy on deck sometimes you've got to collect your thoughts in this game of baseball and figure out what you want to throw how do you want to navigate the inning do i want to pitch around this guy etc cetera, etc cetera. we're losing some of that because you gotta you gotta move so quick so i think it's going to be a huge adjustment for the hitters and and the pitchers thank god they have spring training to get through it and then the one that just doesn't make any sense to me is the the, uh, only the two throwovers that's going to change the game quite a bit you know the base running is going to be different the only two throwovers i mean uh, these pitching coaches are going to have to have these pitchers throwing the ball 1.3 to the plate delivery or you know it's 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 going to be it's going to be a strange thing for everybody to deal with that and i'll even add one more the one that i don't even understand and i just don't know why we even did it was the the bigger uh, pizza boxes for bases I don't get that. I mean, geez, the little league, little leaguers are playing with the regular base, and we're using bigger bases in the big leagues for safety. So they say. I don't get it. <laughs> hey, Ron, we'll let you go. I know you got a lot going on today. Have a great 2023 campaign. We got great belief in you, and uh, and you know, let's see what the club can do this year. I I I'm, I hope for the best, and hopefully, if I, if we get down to Arizona in a few weeks, we'll get a chance to come over and say hi. Oh, I look forward to talking with you. Sorry about all the distractions. I'm I'm a chocolate mess. I got to go get my dog off the roof. He's on the roof with the solar guys right now trying to help install the solar system. Oh, no. Ron, <laughs> thanks again for your time. Have a great day. All right. You too. Take care. Ron Wotus uh, checking in with us. Uh, All right, the great Ron Wood is stopping by there, um, and we appreciate. It. And we, you know, we tried to make it work with the with the cameras and the and the everything, but it didn't. We couldn't get the the connection right. And he's got people working on his house. He's got guys putting solar on the roof. He's got the dog barking. We're uh, we uh, had to go to the the cell phone, but good stuff. And I hope you guys enjoyed some of that conversation with Ron Wotus and let's talk a little giants right now. I just put the, uh, the video uh, link in there. If somebody wants to jump in, otherwise we can just read the chats. Um, but where are you with the giant? There we go. Muted my mic there for a second, but where are you with the giants spring training officially kicks off today. The giants pitchers and catchers held their first workout today uh, at Scottsdale stadium and, you know, obviously they wanted Aaron Judge. They didn't get Aaron Judge. They wanted Carlos Correa. They didn't get Carlos Correa. Um, they still committed $193.6 million to seven free agents who they're hoping uh, and they believe are going to help them improve from last year's disappointing finish. Now, the Giants finished 500 last year, but you never would have known it because it was that kind of a year where they just had to, they had to finish fast late to get to 500. And I guess the question is, <clears throat> what do you see? 
What do you predict for the Giants this year? Now, fan graphs, they have their Zips projection system. They currently have the Giants in third place in the National League West this year. They think the Giants are going to win 88 games um, and finish only three games behind the Dodgers and Padres. Uh, baseball prospectus is not – they use the Pakoda projections. They're not quite as rosy as the Zips projections. They're for, forecasting 82 wins for the Giants. So to me, I would probably lean right there with the Pakoda per, uh, perspective, the baseball prospectus Pakoda uh, projections. I think the Giants are like a, about a 500 team. I, I, I don't, I don't think, I don't think they're going to be a, a nightmare team that wins 68 games. Uh, but I also don't think they're going to be a surprise team that wins, you know, 85 plus. I think they're probably going to be sub 85. So I'm thinking right around 500, maybe 82 and 80. Um, you know, Kapler, if you look at his career with the Phillies and with the Giants, he's basically a 500 manager. I mean, they win as many as they lose. Um, there's no real reason to feel like the Giants are going to be dramatically better than last year. They lost Carlos Rodon. They lost Evan Longoria. They lost Brandon Belt. Um, is David VR an upgrade on Long Longori at third? I don't know. I would say no. Uh, JD Davis, is he an upgrade on Longori at third? Definitely not defensively. I mean, maybe offensively. Um, and then at first, I think the Giants lose something significant in Brandon Belt. And you heard Woda say there that he likes a tall first baseman. So um, I think first base is is a TBD. And I thought it was really interesting that he said Jock Peterson. He expect Jock, He expects Jock Peterson to play some first base. Now, I, I did not expect that. I don't know what you. Oh, there we go. I was muted. Um, you know, he, he, I would like to see the, see the giants go with an everyday second baseman and, um, and move, move Tyro Estrada to more of a, uh, more of a role at shortstop sharing that position with Brandon Crawford. To me, I, that's that I'd rather have Estrada and Crawford sharing shortstop and, you know, and, and not having, Crawford have to run run out there every single day at short and then Estrada every day at second. I'd rather those guys sh share shortstop and go get a different second baseman. Um, and there were options and there still are decent options out there in the free agent market at second base. There are guys out there they could get, but they, they want to go with Estrada at second and Crawford at short. Um, I like Crawford at short. I just think they need a backup. They got to have somebody who can play shortstop outside of Brandon Crawford who can play 20, 30 games. So when you go up against a couple of real tough lefties, you can sit Crawford and you can, you don't have to lean on him to play every inning. I mean, the giants have leaned on Brandon Crawford more than almost any club has ever leaned on any player. I mean, he just, they just expect him to continuously go out there and play shortstop 150 times a year. I mean, their only backup shortstops on the roster are Tyro and Ford Proctor. So Crawford's going to play a ton of shortstop this year again. And to me, I think they'd be way better off if they would just, you know, sit him against some tough lefties 
and put Estrada in there at shortstop against some tough lefties and get somebody else at second base. Now, maybe that somebody else is Izon Diaz. Who knows? Uh, I do like what I saw to Izon Diaz's bat, you know, but he also is a left-handed hitter. So, you know, what do you do against the tough left-handed pitchers at second base? Obviously, you're going to go Estrada, but then you're going to play Crawford at shortstop, and he's a lefty on a lefty. So that's that's kind of a net negative situation there. Um, I think they'll be way better in the outfield. I mean, Michael Conforto is probably going to have a bounce back year in left. You know, he's not old. He's a better fielder than what they've had out there in the past. You know, they put Darren Ruff in left last year, and Darren Ruff struggled. He's just not a left fielder. I mean, he's probably not even a first baseman. He's really a DH. So you had you had Darren Ruff and Peterson and Yermin Mercedes, and, and left field was a circus last year as far as defensively. Um, this year, you got Conforto. Um, you know, Jock Peterson maybe plays out there a little bit. Haniger in a pinch can play out there a little bit. Um, Yaz, I would imagine, is going to play center. But you're, you know, you heard you heard Kapler at the Fan Fest say that, you know, Tyro Estrada may play a little center field. And, you know, they obviously still have Austin Slater, who was one of their better hitters last year. So, you know, the, the outfield is Conforto and left, Haniger and right. Slater and Yaz sharing center field and um, the wild cards, I guess, are Luis Gonzalez, who, you know, Luis Gonzalez is a nice player. I, I like Luis Gonzalez. I mean, to me, that was one of Farhan's better pickups. Um, and then Stephen Piscotti has been invited. He's a non-roster invitee. Stephen Piscotti, I think, is a better player than people give him credit for. Um, he's not old. He's 32. He's a local kid from Pleasanton. Last year, he hit 190 in 126 at-bats, and his on-base was 252. So he has clearly backslid from the player that came into the big leagues with the Cardinals. But you know what? <clears throat> Maybe um, switching from the American League to the National League, you know, you look at what he did early in his career with the Cardinals. Came up in 2015. In, you know, in a small sample size, let's say half a season or so, hit 300, 305. Um, next year, he hit 22 home runs, hit 273. Uh, the next year in 2017, he hit 235 with nine home runs. And then, you know, he had the, his, the, the sad tragedy of his mother uh, and the disease that she had. And then he had he wanted to come to the Bay Area because he's from Pleasanton and the, and the A's picked him up. He had a 267 season with 27 home runs as recently as 2018. Then he goes 249 in 2019 with 13 home runs in 93 games. 2020 was a 45 game season, hit 226. 21 was 72 games, hit 220. And last year, 42 games hit 190. So as you can see, 226, 220, 190. He's not, you know, he's trending in the wrong direction from, you know, 2018, his first year with Oakland, he had 27 home runs. He's hitting 267 with a 330 on base. And then the bottom has fallen out 19, 20, 21, three years in a row. Obviously the pandemic in there as well. Uh, Piscotti hasn't done much, but you know, he's a right-handed hitter. He has power. The giants have a ton of, ton of coaches. Maybe they can unlock something in Steven Piscotti. Um, you know, maybe, maybe somehow, some way Piscotti can give them a little something that, um, you know, he hasn't been given the A's the last couple of years. I'm eager to see what Piscotti has got and if he can make this team, because if he can, you know, he might be able to give them some right-handed power. I mean, look at their, look at their outfield. Conforto, left-handed hitter, Gonzalez, left-handed hitter, Yaz, left-handed hitter. The only real right-handed bats they have out there they added Hanniger, and you've got Slater, um, and that's it. Everybody else is a left-handed hitter. So, I mean, they're very left-handed in the outfield. If they could have a right-handed bat with some thump, I think that would be really, really nice. So, you know, just something to look for in the, in the season ahead for sure. Um, but I think it's going to be I, – I think it's going to be real challenging for sure to, um, you know, for this team to – to compete for a playoff spot, 
but you never know. It's baseball. You never know. They could show up. Casey Schmidt could be raking. Um, you know, all of a sudden they could look up. Elliot Ramos could have figured it out. Uh, a young player or two could emerge. You know, I've heard great things about RJ Dabovich, um, the reliever, you know, Sean Jelly, Cole Waits. You know, there's some there's some interesting uh, players. Is Joey Bart going to take that next step forward? Is Blake Sable going to be able to make this roster and hit? So, I mean, there's a, to me, I mean, <clears throat> we all know the Giants are challenged. Um, they tried to get Correa. They tried to get Judge. It didn't work out. They tried then to, p- to pivot and add a couple pieces in the outfield. And they've added some decent pieces. Um, I like their, I like their, their, their additions. I just was hoping that they would make a few more. Um, I was hoping for at least one more outfielder, one more infielder. I was definitely hoping for a couple of power arms out of the pen. But, you know, I know um, we're going to have Marty on tomorrow, and I know Marty's real confident that they have the arms. Um, I'm not quite as confident. Now, Camilo Doval, you know, start with the pen. you got to have a bullpen. Camilo Doval, I really like, you know, and they added Taylor Rogers, so now they got a veteran lefty in their pen. You've got Tyler Rogers, who's a rubber arm who can go every day. Same with Brebia. Uh, Scott Alexander was a nice addition last year. You know, maybe Sammy Long is a long man down in the pen. Um, you know, Cole Waits is a, is a young arm. RJ Dabovich, Randy Rodriguez. These are some young arms. They added Luke Jackson from the Braves. He could give them a, a decent right-handed arm. So, you know, and there's more arms besides that who aren't, you know, who are, who are in their system, who potentially could break through. And then rotation wise, you know, I don't know what the rotation is going to look like because, you know, Logan Webb and Alex Cobb are ground ball pitchers. They pitch to contact. They really have to have good defense played behind them. If the giants can improve their defense uh, this year, then Logan Webb and Alex Cobb might, might have good years, but if they can't, that could be a real, real struggle. And then uh, Di Scafani, can he bounce back? Can Wood give you another year? The one thing with the Giants, they lost Rodon, but they've got some pretty good depth. Webb, Cobb, Di Scafani, Wood, Stripling, those are your top five. But you still have Sean Manaya, or I should say you added Sean Manaya. You still have Sean Jelly. You have Tristan Beck. Um, you know, they added Joe Ross. They added Sean Newcomb. You know, he's a non-roster invitee. And that's kind of, to me, that's an interesting guy as well, um, Newcomb, because Newcomb is a lefty who's got talent. Uh, there's, you know, and then you got Jacob Junis, you know, still in the mix there. So they've, you know, they've got that guy. They've got Keaton Wynn. You know, they've got some some decent arms, uh, but they're just going to have to find some answers. And, you know, who knows? Maybe a Luis Matos or an Elliot Ramos or a or, um, you know, a Hunter Bishop or somebody or, you know, Marco Luciano. You never know who's going to have a huge offseason, show up in spring and be really ready to go. Um, so, you know, is it is it a is it a great team? No. Is it a is it a is it a, a hundred loss team? No, no, it's not. It's it's somewhere in the middle there. I would say they're they're going to. They're going to be roughly in and around 500. They, you know, and if they can find some answers, maybe they'll surprise. I will say this: just seeing Jock Peterson at the Fan Fest, seeing Jock Peterson at the Warrior game, it's pretty clear that Jock Peterson has has gotten in better shape. So, I mean, Jock could hit 40 bombs if they give him enough at bats. You know, they may need some kind of unforeseen. Maybe Mitch Hanniger dials it back to the year that he had 40, close to 40 bombs. Uh, the Giants haven't had a 30 home run hitter in a while. They may get that this year. Hanniger or Jock may pop 30. So, you know, is it a, you know, we don't know what Luciano is going to be this year. Maybe, maybe he won't break through. You know, we don't know if Matos can break through. Um, but you never know. You show up in camp. And, you know, the one thing in baseball that's interesting and the one reason that you just can't, you just kind of, kind of got to see how it plays, plays out is that guys have variable years. You know, one year, a guy could hit 330. I mean, there's countless examples of this. A guy hits 330. The next year he comes back, he's hitting 228. It happens. 
in football, it typically, typically does not happen that way. In baseball, that's exactly how it happens. Guys have big years. Guys have down years. Um, you know, Eric Hernandez says Vaughn Brown is the future. You know, it's funny. I asked Will Clark. I did an interview with Will Clark on 95.7 The Game earlier this year. I asked him, give me two guys in the, in the minors that you're really excited about their future. And he said, Casey Schmidt and Vaughn Brown. And Schmidt, they think, is an awesome defensive third baseman whose bat's coming around and just had a pretty good year at double A. Vaughn Brown, I think, is a little bit on the younger side, but, um, you know, he's a, they think, maybe the center fielder of the future and a guy who he could break through. So, I mean, they need, they need to be lucky this year. Let's be honest about it. Um, they, on paper, the Giants don't look like a contender, they really don't. To me, losing Rodon and replacing him with Stripling and Manaya is is not a net positive. I think that's a net negative. I like Stripling, loved him at A and M. I think he's underrated, and I, and I was arguing that Manaya was an arm I would definitely want to add. But do they add up to a Rodon? You know, I don't know. I would have loved to have seen them keep Rodon and add one or two of those guys instead. Um, you know, they let Rodon go. So they, they're missing that, that, that horse at the top of the rotation that even if you're not hitting, man, this guy goes out there and throws seven shutout strikes out eight and you get a real easy win. Um, they're not going to be able to lean on that this year, you know? So it's, it's, it's going to be a challenge uh, on that regard, in that regard, as far as the non-roster guys, you know, there's a couple guys to keep your eyes on here. I mean, one of them is Kyle Harrison. You know, Kyle Harrison, I saw him last year in the Futures game, and he gave up two titanic shots. Uh, the Yankees center field prospect, Dominguez, took him out to center field. And then the uh, the Twins prospect, Walliner, uh, hit one out, I think, Dodger Stadium down the left field or down the right field line. But, you know, you're still talking about a big-time talent. I mean, there's no question. Kyle Harrison is a huge talent. He's 6'2". He throws 97, 98 miles an hour. He's got a super funky Chris Sale, Madison Bumgarner kind of uh, side angle. And, you know, so it's not sidearm, but it's like it's not over the top. It's not three quarters. It's between three quarters and sidearm. He's got a very uh, odd uh, arm slot, and he throws smoke. I mean, we're talking about 98. He's got multiple pitches. You know, if Kyle Harrison broke through and won you 15 games, you know, your, your equations change quite a bit there. I mean, he, he could he could change things just with that that addition alone. Uh, Dabovich, I think, is a, is a high-end reliever that could impact things. Um, Sean Newcomb, as I said before, I really like. He's a left-handed pitcher, 6'5", big kid, huge kid, 6'5", like 250, 260, and he's got good stuff. Uh, and he's had good stuff for years. So remember that name. Sean Newcomb is a guy that absolutely could surprise. They have Joe Ross in this camp, whose brother Tyson Ross, uh, you know, these guys are Bay Area guys. I think the I think Joe maybe went to O'Dowd. Uh, I know Tyson went to O'Dowd. So, you know, that's a veteran arm who could impact the rotation, you know, if, if uh, you know, if they, they need an extra arm. I think there's some interesting guys behind the plate to watch in this camp as well. You know, the Giants have Brett Auerbach, who had a real good camp last year. He's a 5'9 catcher, but he's a great athlete, I mean, a tremendous athlete and a really good competitor. Um, and I didn't think he was that far away from the big leagues when I saw him last year. So you got Brett Auerbach, you got Patrick Bailey, who's a switch hitter, who was a first round draft choice, who has not come of age yet. You've got Ricardo Genevez behind the plate. Uh, they signed the veteran Roberto Perez. So there's some interesting names behind the plate that if, um, you know, that beyond Joey Bart, who's going to be that second catcher? Are they going to keep three? Does does the job go to Perez or do they go with some of these young guys? Austin Wins is still there. And then the other, um, as far as the other non-roster invitees, a couple names to keep your eyes on. One is Colton Welker. You know, Colton Welker was a hot prospect with the Rockies organization. It wasn't that long ago. And you're talking about a guy, you know, a third baseman. Now, they're pretty stacked at third, right? You got VR, uh, you got Casey Schmidt, 
you got, you know, you got Will Wilson, you've got obviously JD Davis, you know, you got a number of guys who can play third base. But Colton Welker is a doubles machine. I mean, this guy could pound out 30, 40 doubles. I, I, I would not be shocked at all if Colton Welker had a really good camp. So I would say keep your eyes on Colton Welker. Keep your eyes on Casey Schmidt, who's going to be wearing number 97 in camp for the Giants. Um, those are the infielders that I'm, I'm the non-roster invitee infielders. In the outfield, the non-roster guys I think to keep an eye on are Vaughn Brown, who's going to wear number 96, um, and Stephen Piscotty. You know, Piscotty. There's also Bryce Johnson, who can play a pretty good center field, but I'm kind of don't really think he's got a major league bat. But Piscotty and Vaughn Brown in the outfield, uh, Colton Welker, Casey Schmidt in the infield, um, Genevez, Auerbach, and Bailey behind the plate, and then Joe Ross, um, Sean Newcomb, maybe even Eric Miller, who you know they got from the Phillies, the six five lefty. He once upon a time had a really, you know, they had a really uh, high thought on him across baseball that he was going to have a real great future. We'll see. He's been kind of derailed. The other guy who's kind of interesting that I thought looked great at times last year was Mauricio Lavera, who, you know, you look at his dimensions, 5'11", 224 pounds, and you think, you know, you don't think much of that those dimensions. But, man, when you watch him throw, I mean, he was 96 miles an hour last year. Uh, he's got good stuff. And if he's healthy, he might be an arm out of the pen. And then, of course, don't forget, don't sleep on Kyle Harrison. Um, don't sleep on RJ Dabovich. I mean, Melvin Adone has a massive arm, but he's had so many problems that I can't imagine he's going to make it. But you never know. I mean, God knows he's got a good enough arm to make it in the big leagues if they wanted to go in that direction. So just a couple, you know, <laughs> Eddie, Eddie cases, Eckerton. I like Eckerton. Yeah. From, uh, from, uh, <laughs> Dan coach Emilio in the chat says I will get Schmidt Vaughn Brown and Sable. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see. Um, I don't know. Casey Schmidt, they say is a phenomenal fielder. Vaughn Brown. Will Clark says is a future big leaguer. Sable, as you heard Ron Woda say is, um, you know, I mean, maybe, maybe an offensive player. So, you know, that's there, there's some offensive hope for Sable behind the plate. I think they're going to need as much offense as they can find this year. And so that's going to be, that's going to be interesting to see exactly, um, you know, where the offense comes from. They're going to need to get offense this year out of places. They're not banking on offense. So what does that mean? Well, it means that, you know, hopefully Joey Bart's ascension as a hitter continues. Um, hopefully they can figure out first base. I, I really think there's a need at first base. You know, Wilmer Flores, J.D. Davis, Lamont Wade. I, I like Wilmer against lefties. Um, I'd rather see J.D. at third, but he could play first in a pinch. Um, I'm just not a Wade fan. I mean, I... I don't know. I don't. I, I. I don't see what Farhan sees in Lamont Wade. I see a 29-year-old player who hit 207 last year with eight home runs and over 200 at bats, and whose on-base percentage was 305. You know, those are really, really low numbers. Um, so I and 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 when you factor in first base as an offensive position, um. That's interesting. To me, the most interesting aspect of what we got out of out of Wotus today was that Jock Peterson might be um a for, might log some some time at first base. So um MF says the Giants brass and and Buster Posey talked to Sable over the phone for over 45 minutes. I'm not, I'm not sure what that means, but um uh, you know, maybe that's a good thing. Hey, they talked to Buster. They talk to Buster on the phone. MF says Jacob Junis. Yeah, I think Junis is a wild card because Junis, I think Junis at times looked like a, 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 a pretty good starting pitcher. Um, Jenny Vega says Luciano's dealing with back problems right now. Yeah, I've read that as well. Um, Eric says Vaughn Brown is the future. So, you know, I would love it. I would absolutely love it if Vaughn Brown was the future. So, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's an, it's, um, it's a team that 
you know, they're, I, I would say if you're looking at them today on paper, they don't look great, but um, you never know. You never know. You know, I, I would, the one thing with Farhan is, you know, he's going to continue making moves. So you can't overreact to what it looks like. I don't know that they've looked good on paper in any of the years, including the year they won 107. Now that team had Buster Posey and let's not mistake that. That's a huge difference, but um, outside of Buster, you know, I don't see a dramatic difference between some of the clubs they went to spring training with, um, you know, during this regime in this club, you know, there's different strengths, different weaknesses, different question marks, but still all, all, uh, you know, are the giants going to win 90? I don't see that. I really don't, but I don't think they're going to win 70 either. I I, I think they're probably going to win 80. You said, what are they going to do? I'd say eh, 82 and 80, 80 and 82, right? Right. In and around 500, unless they make some significant changes or significant additions uh, as we go. And it's possible. It's absolutely possible. So um, do I have awesome high hopes for the season? Not necessarily, but I'm also not thinking this is going to be some record-setting, awful, horrendous year. I just don't see the playoff team. Now they have added a play and they have added a playoff teams to the mix. So, you know, there's, it's a little easier to make the playoffs than it used to be, but it's not that easy. I mean, you're still going to have to, you're still going to have to win 85 games or more. And, you know, there, as you can see, I'm saying they're going to win 80, 82. There's not a huge difference between winning 85 and winning 80, 82, but um, it's going to be a challenging division. And I think anybody who thinks otherwise is probably not looking at it right. Dodgers, really good, even with their offseason where they haven't had a great offseason. They still have added some some decent players. Um, and and they obviously were quite a bit better than the Giants last year. Padres, better team for sure. I think Arizona's better. So to me, it's about can they hold off, you know, Colorado for that and 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 not finish last this year. That would be my that would be my hope for the year is that they can finish in front of Colorado and maybe challenge Arizona for third in the division. But I'm I if you made me bet it today, I'd take Arizona. They're just younger. They have more players in their prime. Uh, the Giants have players that are a little younger than they want, a little older than they want. Not as many players in their prime. Not as many top prospects. You know what I'm saying? So I kind of look at Arizona as better than than um, than the Giants. Uh, Michael says 84 and 78, just enough to justify a Farhan extension. <laughs> Giants Niner fan says he loves Wotus. Yeah, Wotus is the man. He absolutely is. Mike sa- or MF says trade a big time trade for a big time player at the deadline. Yeah. I mean that, you know, if you can, if you can, if you have got the right prospects to make a deal, Mike says, will the Giants trade for Brian Reynolds? Uh, Brian Reynolds is going to cost a lot has made in the USA says here in the next chat. He says Reynolds is kind of expensive, kind of expensive. Um, <laughs> I got this one, Larry, who's a better hang Kapler or Sirianni? I don't know I, that I can't answer. Eddie says Bart should think about altering his swing. I see it being too home run happy. You know what? I saw a huge improvement last year from Bart. Uh, offensively, defensively, you know, to me, uh, if you say, give me something that you're excited about, I'm excited about him. I I think, I think Joey Bart, if he continues to get better, is going to be a 25 home run catcher who, you know, is a really good catch and throw guy who is improving every year. Um, I, I see to me, he's, he's the one homegrown player that, is an everyday guy right now. And I, and I feel good about his future. All right, let's do this. Let's thank our title sponsor. We are brought to you by pig and a pickle. Check them out online at pig and a Uh, they got two locations. They're in Corte Madera, three, four, one Corte Madera town center. Once again, three, four, one Corte Madera town center. They're also in the Emeryville public marketplace, a uh, really cool spot. And if you haven't been to pig and a pickle, Man, you need to try it. They're open 11 a.m. to 8 p.m. 
every day in Marin County. The pulled pork is amazing. The brisket is amazing. The baby back ribs, the barbecue chicken, it's all great. Um, really check out Pig in a Pickle. Get the brief, the beef brisket chili and ask for the uh, the kettle tallow potato chips. But they do catering, craft beers, kids menu, family meals, salads, sandwiches, Pig in a Pickle. It's awesome barbecue. Damon and Mary work at it. They got a phenomenal restaurant. Check them out. Uh, in Marin County, in Corte Madera, also in Emeryville. They're open Wednesday through Sunday in Emeryville. Pig and a Pickle, the best barbecue in the Bay Area. Um, also, he's. I've got this one. Larry, have you shared your thoughts on the rules changes? No, we're going to do that in just a minute. <laughs> Eddie says, pay the bills, Larry. Don't be lazy. Don't be lazy. Um, we've got, uh, we also want to give show you our latest video. Yes, we got a, little, a new video from Pig in a Pickle, and here it is. Thanks to Tony Casera and the good people at Casera's Italian Menswear. They are housing the Krug Show t-shirts, and they're a proud sponsor of the show as well. The Krug Show t-shirt, the Krug Show podcast t-shirt is available there at their store in Dublin. Their address is 7372 San Ramon Road in Dublin, California. And go see Tony Casera and get yourself a Krug Show t-shirt and support the show. And special thanks to our sponsor, New York Style Italian Sausage. That's right, NewYorkStyleSausage.com is their website. Phenomenal product, whether it's the breakfast sausage, the Italian mild, the Italian spicy, the chorizo. You cannot go wrong with New York Style Italian Sausage. Once again, NewYorkStyleSausage.com, often imitated, never equaled. All right. <clears throat> Welcome back to the Krug Show on a Thursday. Now, what do we have coming up on the show? Later on today, um, <clears throat> Jesse Naylor is going to join us. We're going to talk a little 49ers coming up today at, I believe that's going to be 7 o'clock tonight. So we'll go live tonight with Jesse Naylor at 7 o'clock, and we'll talk a little 49er football and how he sees the offseason ahead uh, with the quarterbacks, with the draft, with the uh, – with free agency starting in about, what, three weeks, roughly three weeks away from NFL free agency. A couple thoughts, though, on the uh, the rules changes before we bolt for the door. Um, oh, by the way, Mark Graves says he got his shirt, and the shirts are outstanding. Yes, if you want a Krug Show t-shirt, just somehow uh, get a hold of me and uh, tell me you want one. All I need to know is where you live. Um, and Vicky Pellich, I just got yours out to you, uh, but where you live and what size you want, they come in large, extra large, two XL and three XL. 
Um, and just uh, and then they're they're twenty five dollars plus ten dollars to ship. So it's thirty five dollars. And I'm just having people Venmo me if you if you want a crude show shirt and then I will have one sent to you pronto. And it takes three or four days to get there. But Mark got his and I'm glad that he did. Um, and it's a good looking shirt. Absolutely good looking shirt. It's just like our logo. So it's a cool looking, cool looking shirt. And if you want one, we have plenty of shirts. I ordered, uh, what did I order about a hundred, 150 shirts and we've already gotten rid of about 20 of them. So <clears throat> if anybody would like a shirt, just contact me, tell me what size, tell me where you are, and then I'll send you my Venmo and we can, uh, we can work that out and I'll get it sent out to you pronto. All right. As far as the, uh, the rules changes in baseball, um, <clears throat> actually Romo says, Hey, uh, Larry, any more interviews coming? Dan, appreciate the upcoming coverage you are going to get. Oh, well, good for Danny. Um, okay. So the pitch timer, um, the basics are to, they're trying to create a crisper pace of play. So there's going to be a 30 second timer between batters, then a 15 second timer between each pitch with the bases empty. And then a 20 second timer between each pitch with the runners on base. So the rule is that the pitcher has to go into this motion prior to the expiration of the timer or else be charged with a ball. Um, and the pitcher, <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's, it's just, first of all, you got three different times there. And then the pitcher is allotted to what they're calling disengagements. So that's just either a step off or a pickoff attempt without penalty. If he tries to make a third pickoff attempt and the runner is safe at first, it will be called a balk. So what you're going to see, think about this. Guy goes over to first once. Go, guy goes over to first two times. Now, now it's going to create this kind of circus. And this is where I think it's junky, to be completely honest. Um <clears throat> That third engagement, that third disengagement, I should say, it's a balk if you don't get the guy. Okay. But the runner knows that too. So the runner is going to take after two pickoff throws. I think the the game plan, I think what you're going to see is nobody's going to either the pitchers aren't going to throw it all to first. They're just going to look over there um, and vary their time to the plate. Because if they go over there twice, then when they go over a third time, they have to get the guy or it's a balk. So think about that. The As soon as uh, you have a fast runner on first, let's say you get whoever the fastest runner on the Giants is, he's, he's at first base. He takes a big lead. He draws a throw. They don't get him. He draws a second throw. They don't get him. Now, what do you think is going to happen? That runner is going to take a huge lead. He should at least, right? He's going to take a huge lead. So he could take a huge lead and go to second on first movement. Or, and then it becomes a, what, a stolen base attempt. Um, so you might see a lot of that where you've got this, there's two, two throws to first. They don't get him. Now the runner's taking a massive lead. He's daring the pitcher to throw over there. And either he either he can get back to the bag, and if he does beat the throw back to the bag, then it's automatically a balk and he's on second base. Or he could take a huge lead, and when the throw goes to first, he could take off for second and try to beat the throw from first to second. I mean, it's just it's junky. I mean, it's seriously junky. Um, Eric Hernandez says, who other, who, <laughs> who other than Manfred thought these rules changes were a good thing? I mean, the intention was right, but I mean, what the heck? <laughs> I mean, that's just so junky. Uh, MF says, these rules give me a headache. And then you heard, um, and, and okay, and then it doesn't end there. The batter's got to be in the batter's box and alert to the pitcher by the eight-second mark of the timer or else be charged with an automatic strike. So we have automatic balls, automatic strikes, automatic box. I mean, it's just, it's mind-numbing. 
And then the pitch timer, I guess the pitch timer in the minors last year reduced the average game time by 25 minutes. And that's really what they're after. Um, the limit on pickoff attempts led to a 26% increase in stolen base attempts. So now you have more steals, but the game goes faster. So we're not sure how it all translate at will translate at the major league level. Um, but they think that this is going to lead to a reduction in the length of games and the increase in stolen base attempts. All right, we'll have to see it. We'll have to see it carried out. But I'll say this, that just got, you just heard Wotus talking about how the pitchers are not used to pitching with the clock at all. So they're down there and and, and you don't even get a chance to take a breath. And now you're probably going to serve up some three-run bomb because, you know, you didn't get to focus on what pitch you wanted to throw because you're so worried about the clock. I just think it it, it takes a game that used to have kind of a leisurely freedom to it and now there's no freedom and to me that's not going to be fun and i don't want i wouldn't want to be the one to have to penalize and 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 monitor that and i mean i i don't envy the umpires i mean you got to remember this is a game that's played every day there's 162 of these 100 and there's nine innings that's a lot of that's a lot of watching the seconds. I mean, you just made the umpire's job like way more difficult and way more annoying. So that I don't, that this one, you know, I guess if it has the desired result and the game speed up and there's a little bit more action within the game, maybe this could be a good thing, but just reading the rule is exhausting. <laughs> and MF says, who are the giants fastest runners? I don't know. I don't know, who would you say is the fastest guy on the team? Lamont Wade? Uh, I don't know. Who? who bright, uh, looking at this. Maybe Lamont Wade. Maybe Tyro. Um, <laughs> I don't see a lot of speed. I mean, that's the thing. This is where the Giants, they don't have tons of power. They don't have tons of speed. Elliot Ramos is probably can run a little bit. Austin Slater can run a little bit. Yaz can run a little bit. Luis Gonzalez can run a little bit. Um, but there's no, like, you know, it might be worth picking up a Jorge Mateo. You know, and I mentioned this a few weeks ago in a video that I did that Mateo is out there to be had. He does not much of a hitter, but he's maybe one of the best runners in the game. And it would be nice to have a Jorge Mateo. Um, you know, in the late innings to take advantage of some of these rules, you take a big lead, you take a big lead. And all of a sudden now he's at second. Now maybe he's at third, you know, it'd be nice to get somebody with impact speed. I saw the Orioles are shopping Jorge Mateo and the giants don't really have a backup shortstop outside of Tyro. Jorge Mateo might be a nice addition. You know, you may see Farhan go for some speed at some point in this camp as he sees the rules kind of play out. Um, the shift restrictions now, okay, here's the shift restrictions as a pitch is thrown, the defensive team has to have a minimum of four players within the outer boundary of the infield and at least two infielders completely on either side of the bag, or else a penalty will be an automatic called ball. And the rule is aimed at showcasing, you know, more athleticism and kind of restoring the traditional, uh, outcomes of balls put in play. Uh, if a pitch it says, what happens if a, now this is the junkie part. What happens if a pitch and a play go off, even though there's a violation of the shift rule? Let's say the second baseman's got a foot on side. Of, he's got a foot on the left side of the second base bag and the pitch goes off anyway. And somebody hits the ball out of the ballpark. Well, <laughs> in football, teams can decline a penalty. If the same thing's going to happen here. The offensive team can then decline the penalty and take, let's say, the home run. They they can accept the result of the play. So if somebody hits a screaming double, but the second baseman had one foot on the shortstop side of the bag, um, the team that's hitting can say, ah, yeah, I know it's a penalty, but we're, we're we'll wave off the penalty and we'll take the home run. We'll wave off the penalty and we'll take the single uh, or double. 
Now, what if you're down by a lot of runs? What if you're down five runs and the shortstop is on the, you know, is on the wrong side of the bag and you need base runners and you, and the guy hits, um, the guy hits, uh, you know, I don't know. The guy gets a, a single, but he's a big time power hitter and there's two guys on and two guys out. Do you take the single and let him and, and, and let the guy one run score? Or do you say, Hey, you know what? This guy's a 40 home run power hitter, which he's trying to pop one out. He's trying to get extra bases, you know, so it may have some debate as far as declining the penalty or not. But even that whole idea of declining a penalty is just so football that I just can't stand that. I like the idea of the restrictions. I just don't like the idea of the penalty being, you know, this, okay, well, we're going to call the penalty. Oh, we're going to decline the penalty. I mean, it's just, it's just a lot. It's a lot there, but overall I would say I, I don't like the pitch timer. I do like the shift restrictions. Ron said that he thought the bigger bases was kind of a joke. The bases are now 18 inches on each side instead of the 15 inches on each side. It allows the players more room to operate around the bases to reduce the risk of injury. Uh, There was a 13% decline in injuries near the bases in the minors last year. And that could also encourage runners to be more aggressive on stolen base attempts. The success rate on steal attempts in the minors with the bigger bases increased between one and 2%. I mean, that's not a, that's such a small increase that I don't, you're really going to make a change for a one or 2% increase in steals in the minor leagues that could be attributable to anything. That's probably within the, you know, in the plus minus of just randomness. Uh, I, I, that's probably no impact at all. So I'm not a fan of the bigger bases. I'm not a fan of the pitch clock. But I would like a little faster game. We'll see how the pitch clock can deliver that. Um, but I'm not a fan of the shift restrictions either. I mean, I like the shift restrictions. I just don't like the penalties and the whole, oh, you can decline. You can't, you know, I mean, it's just like, and then what happened, just the complexity of that. And, you know, t- try to explain what happened there. Well, you know what? They're down five runs, but they the guy hit a single. Um but the shortstop was on the left side of the bag, on the, on the on the right side of the bag by an inch, and so now the the team gets to reverse it. But it was only a single, and the guy's a big power hitter, and they're looking to pop a double or a home. I mean, it's just it's junky. It's too much change for a game that goes back to 1870. And this is where I don't I don't believe in Rob Manfred. I don't believe in any commissioner to make this many wholesale changes to um <laughs> to to a game that goes back to the 1870s i just think it's junky richard hutchinson shaking my head declining penalties yeah i know i know it's absolutely it's ridiculous uh eddie k says mad dog russo stop trying to reinvent the game seriously stop you know there is i've never walked out of a baseball game and neither have any of you where somebody said that game sucked but man, if it had been 20 minutes quicker, it would have been awesome. I mean, I've never walked out of a baseball game and heard anybody ever say that game was 20 minutes too long. Ever. Ever. <laughs> now, college football games are eternal. They refuse to end. They're they're four hours plus. It's way too much. It just, it just needs a better pace. There's a sport that's too long. By the way, college football and their and their long games, it's like it's like the second fastest growing sport in America behind the NFL is college football. So how come college football can have these eternal games that go on and on and on and on, four hours plus, endless numbers of plays, you know, teams that are on the field for 90 plays or some ridiculous thing. Um, the clock stops in every every first down. And, and every time out, every time it goes out of bounds, I mean, a clock is constantly stopping in college football. The games are eternal and never end. And yet that sport is one of the fastest growing sports, but baseball they think is too long. And they're attributing that to why baseball is not popular. Hey, this just in, my kids play baseball. I've got kids who have played high school baseball and they still aren't that into watching major league baseball. 
if somebody who plays high school baseball is not super into watching major league baseball, Rob Manfred, you have a problem. I have a 13 year old. He's a big time sports fan. He's playing video games and following the game through the, the Bleacher Report app. And when he sees there's action in the late innings, all of a sudden he'll 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 come downstairs or he'll hear me he'll hear me cheering in the watching in the living room. And all of a sudden he'll come downstairs and be like, Dad, what's going on in the game? He's got an interest in the game, but it's too slow and he's following it through the Bleacher Report app. And when he finds out there's two on and two out in the last inning, he comes down to watch for an inning. That's the baseball fan. That's the kid baseball fan in 2023. And these rules aren't changing that. So what you need to do, I think, is make the game cooler, make it more mainstream, make it more inclusive, get more minorities to play the sport in America. You know, it's a very white sport in America. Um, a lot of people feel like baseball is not for them if they're a person of color and they live in America. Um, figure out a way to get um, more people, more and more diversity in your game. And it's you have you have academies in Santo Domingo, but where's your academy in San Francisco? You have academies in Caracas, but you don't have academies in Chicago. So that's kind of a problem. Um, it's also, there's a huge disconnect between that, what it costs. I mean, it costs a ton to play travel ball. And if you don't play travel ball, it's hard to make it past high school. It's hard to make it as a pro. So it really starts to financially ace some kids out. Baseball has got to figure out a way to make their equipment cheaper and the cost of playing their game at the amateur level cheaper. And if they can't bridge that gap, they're going to have serious problems in the generations ahead because right now it's $500 for a bat. It's $3,000 to play travel ball. And, you know, guess what? There's lots of people, whether they live in the inner city or not, that can't expend $5,000 on getting their kid uh, baseball equipment. They can't. And getting them up to speed baseball-wise, they can't do it. That's like sending your kid to private school. And what if you're already sending your kid to private school? You know, then that's 5,000 on top. Ben Bamboo says $500 for a bat. Yep. 500 bucks for a bat. I'm not even joking. I mean, I, I wish I was joking. Um, I mean, seriously, I, I, I might have to put a bat on layaway. Wooden bats are like 75 to 125 a pop and they break. So I don't know. Um, baseball's got to figure out a way to, to, uh, to make itself more attractive to the youth, to get a connection that keeps kids playing baseball through little league into high school and be more competitive with the NBA and the NFL for the top athletes in America. The bottom line is most of the top athletes aren't playing baseball and there's not enough minority uh, participation in baseball domestically. So. Uh, that that's a huge thing. Baseball's view viewed by many, many people as not cool. It's really cool, but it's viewed as not cool. Um, baseball has got to figure out a way to, you know, to market itself and make good decisions about putting the, I mean, there, nobody see their futures game, which is like the equivalent of their young up and coming all-star game. They bury that on a Sunday afternoon be the, the Sunday before the all-star game. Um, nobody watches it. Why? Cause the giants are playing. If you're watching baseball on a Sunday afternoon you, uh, in, you know, in late June or early July before the all-star game, you're watching the giants. If you're in New York, you're watching the Yankees or the Mets. You're not flipping over to, you know, MLB network to watch the futures game. But guess what? If baseball is going to ever have any, um, you know, any, ability to grow, you're going to have to get young people excited about the young stars breaking through into the game. And if you're never showcasing them at all, except, you know, during a Sunday afternoon on the MLB network for a game that gets no ratings at all, guess what? The kids never see that player. They never, they, and, and if they don't see them, they don't want to be them. If they don't see them, they don't want to buy their Jersey. So, I mean, right now, baseball 
young prospects are so kind of not important to the fans that there's no hue and cry for the futures game to be put in prime time. But if that, that's that in and of itself is baseball's problem. They need to have young players busting through like the NFL does, like, like other sports do like the NBA does. People are talking about Victor Wembem Yama because they're anticipating his arrival in the NBA. There's nobody anticipating the arrival of anybody in baseball. Think about that for a second. It's not just the Giants problem. There's no prospect in the game right now that transcends the baseball world and is known outside the baseball world. So baseball's got a real problem. They've got to start marketing their teams more aggressively. They got to start being, you know, marketing their young stars more aggressively. They've got to start partnering with other entities in society to spread their message. They've got to get proactive. They've got to start filling in the blanks or they're going to lose. I'm a baseball fan and I'm going to be a baseball fan and my kids play baseball, but they're not the same caliber of fan that I am. And their kids are not going to be the same caliber of fan that they are. So I think baseball in a way, baseball looks at their bottom line and says, wow, our revenues are exploding. Yeah, but your your popularity is waning. You've never been less relevant with America's 12-year-olds than you are today. Never. I mean, think about that. 12-year-old kids are walking around. The Q rating of NFL players and NBA players is a million times more. Do you know how many more people, if Patrick Beverly were standing on a corner and on the other corner were three of baseball's biggest stars, more people would go over and be like, that's Patrick Beverly. Who's Patrick Beverly? He's just a defensive guard. He's not even a starter. He's like an NBA role player. But if he were standing on a corner in a main, a big time city in America, he would attract a larger crowd than probably Mike Trout. Definitely larger than, you know, Juan Soto and some of the other young players who don't, who don't have very much name recognition. That is a problem for Major League Baseball. People need to know their, their, their players, and they don't. Um, anyway, um, we got this one in the chat. Manfred is a joke. <laughs> Jeffrey Bond. Manfred is a joke. He's just, it just, it's a little tinkering here, a little tinkering there. Oh, also Jeffrey Bond says, RIP Tim McCarver. Yeah, Tim McCarver. Great catcher. Cardinals, Phillies. Um, obviously a phenomenal broadcaster. Did it for a long time. Pissed off a lot of people as a broadcaster. Actually did Giants games for a little while. But uh, yeah, RIP Tim McCarver. Didn't have, you know, all the years I've done this, I'd never had a chance to interview Tim McCarver. But uh, man, there were an awful lot of people that complained about his broadcast. All right. Hope you enjoyed the live stream. We're on tonight at uh, seven o'clock with Jesse Naylor talking Niner football and the off season ahead. Uh, and until then, enjoy the rest of your Thursday. Yeah, never met a man I've been scared of. Careful, you won't get exactly what you asked for. Careful, whatever you bring me, get in hand. Or I answer to no one, I don't need to hassle. Yeah, yeah. we ain't never fall back. Hold our ground.